based on my observations at Sudbury Valley School and what I've learned about hunter-gatherer bands, I've listed five, six characteristics here that I think are similar between a Sudbury Valley School and a hunter-gatherer band. And I think these are the characteristics that optimize the ability of those self-directed education instincts to operate. And so the first characteristic I've listed here is the social expectation and reality that education is children's responsibility. So children come into the world believing it's their responsibility. That's why they start exploring immediately. They don't wait to be taught. They start exploring the world immediately. They learn their language and by the time they're two. You know, they learn so much. They're so motivated to learn, but we can talk them out of it. If we give them the impression that we are in charge of their education and that they have to suppress their own drive to educate themselves in order to do the things that we're telling them to do, we can talk them out of the idea that they're responsible for their education. And they can go on for the rest of their life if they're not successful blaming us for not teaching them right. So if you put the responsibility where it lies on them and you give no pretense that you're responsible for their education, they will hold on to that responsibility. So that's the first character. The second characteristic, and, and this is true in a hunter-gatherer band, it's true at Sudbury Valley, there's nobody, you know, a kid reaches 10 years old and can't read. Nobody at Sudbury Valley comes around and says, don't you think you should start reading now? <laughs> Nobody starts giving them little books to urge them to read because that's their responsibility. There has never been a student who's graduated from Sudbury Valley who couldn't read. And this is despite the fact that they really don't teach reading at the school. Once in a while, a kid will ask for some help reading and then they'll learn, they'll learn to read. Including, just to give an example on reading, when and the graduates that I, of the school that I studied in that, in that study that I just described, two of the graduates of the school told me that they had come to the school at age 15. Each of them, it turns out, at age 15 at different times in the history of the school, unable to read. They had been passed along in the public school with a diagnosis of dyslexia. Both of them told me they learned to read within a few months of being at the school. And I asked, wow, how, how, how could you learn to read when you were at the school? And why did, how, why did you learn, why couldn't you learn to read before? And that both of them in different words, these are two different kids, separate interviews, came at different times, I don't think they even knew one another. Both of them said, in effect, that for the first time in my life, nobody cared if I could read. So that took the pressure off. It was my responsibility. <laughs> And I didn't have to please anybody about it. And it took all the fear away about reading. I think that it's interesting. Danny Greenberg believes, doubts whether there's any such thing as true dyslexia. I actually think there is such a thing as true dyslexia, but I think it's very rare. Most of the people that we call dyslexic are people who haven't learned to read in the context of going to school where there's so much pressure on reading, if at some point you're a little slower at reading and you don't get it, you develop a kind of fear about learning to read and uh, you're very happy when somebody gives you a diagnosis that you can then hide behind, um, that gives you an excuse. So it, it's interesting, there are kids who learn at a wide range of ages, there are some kids who don't learn to read until the latest I know of is 14. but. Uh, but that, even that 14-year-old who I've seen as an adult, he's reading, he's reading philosophy that I would have difficulty reading. You know, he's reading, he had, uh, there's no, nobody who's graduated from the school who's not a good reader. So these, um, so uh, this is a kind of a digression from my point, but the idea of not taking responsibility even when you're pressed because you're gonna getting worried that this kid is never going to learn how to read. They will learn how to read at some point. We live in a literate society. Everybody knows it's important to read. Some people are gonna learn it later than others, but they're all going to learn it, with a few maybe rare exceptions of people who really do have a brain disorder that makes learning to read difficult or impossible. So, second characteristic, unlimited freedom to play, explore, and pursue own interests. I already said that about hunter-gatherers, that's true at Sudbury Valley, unlimited. Nobody's telling, that kid who's 
and building these plasticine villages. He said he would get there as early as the school opened in the morning and he would stay as late at night as they would let him stay. Nobody ever rang a bell telling him he had to move to something else. You need time. You need time to try out different things. You need time to do nothing and get bored. Yeah, so until your soul is stirred by boredom and you finally say it's time to do something. And you need time when you find something you really like to do to delve into it. And maybe then you need time to delve into some other thing that you get interested in. However, however your interests move, you need time to do it. You can't be in a situation where every time you just barely get started at something and a bell rings and it tells you that it's time to do something else. To learn to use the tool. So in our culture, of course, the primary com tool for everybody is the computer, but there are also many other tools that people, depending upon their interests, play with. There's cooking equipment, there's woodworking equipment at the school, there's all kinds of sporting equipment, artistic art equipment, and so on and so forth. Fourth characteristic, opportunity to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. So in the hunter-gatherer band, basically all the adults are available to all of the kids. They don't go after the kids. They don't try to in, in, insert themselves into the children's lives, but they're there. And if, adult, if a child comes to them, uh, they welcome the child. And if the child wants to watch them or even, quote, help them at what they're doing, even though the help is really just interfering, uh, they're glad to let that happen because they recognize that that's how children learn. So the children can have, all the adults are models in some sense for the children of what it's like to be an adult in that culture and they can learn in various ways from any of the adults. At Sudbury Valley School there are fewer adults but there are seven of them and even though there's 170 kids, the adults actually have a lot of free time because the kids don't go to them that much, but they're available if somebody comes to them. <laughs> and, um, and these are people who are not judges. They're like your friendly uncle and aunt who they're cheerleaders for you. They're not evaluating you. And you feel comfortable with them. You feel free to going to them. And each one is different. So. You know, if you need a lap to sit on or a shoulder to cry on, there's one person who would be a good person to go to and another person would be a terrible person to go to for that purpose. <laughs> but that other person might be a good person to go to if you wanted to engage in a political argument. So you would go to different people. For Children are very good at learning very quickly the characteristics of different adults and how to get their needs met, and they can freely go to any of them. Fifth characteristic is that uh, is free age mixing among children and adolescents. This is something that if I had more time I would really elaborate on. It's what much of my own research has focused on and one of my graduate students did his doctoral dissertation on this topic. Daniel Greenberg, who was one of the primary founders of the school, has long argued that the key to why this school works is that children are not segregated by age. Education in this kind of setting would not work if everybody was the same age because children are learning primarily from interacting with other children. And you have less to learn from other people who are at your same level than you do from people who are older or younger than you. Uh, so we've found in studies that a lot of, even though in theory there's enough kids there that the students could just interact with their own age, they don't. They interact across a wide range of ages. The little kids are attracted to the older kids and the older kids are attracted to the little kids. So a lot of the play is age mixed and whenever there's age mixed play, the older kids are boosting the younger ones up into a higher level of play than they would otherwise be able to. So I've seen kids learn to read this way. You're playing a game that involves reading. Some of the kids can read, some can't. And just in the process of playing the game, the ones who can read are sort of pointing out the words and they're showing them how you read these words. And kids are learning, how you've, uh, teenagers love to read to little kids. Little kids are learning to read on teenagers' laps in a way as teenagers are reading the words and sometimes pointing to the words as they're reading. They're not so much trying to teach reading as they're just enjoying reading to the kids and the little kids are, get interested in what, which word was, has what sound and so on. So, um, I, so, there, so little kids are learning, they're also learning just by watching and listening to the bigger kids. They're acquiring a higher vocabulary. Sure, they're picking up some foul language, but they're also, <laughs> they're also uh, picking up more sophisticated ways of talking and thinking than they otherwise would. 
and they are, um, uh, and, 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 and that is, is leading them to want to also, as they see older kids do things that are within their, they think, I could do that, I could, I could do that, then they want to do that. So I've seen, even for reading, when we did a little study of, uh, a few years ago about how children learn to read, and we interviewed children who learned to read at the school and asked them what their motivation was, and one of the kids said, well, you know, when I was five or whatever, I saw these other kids and they were, they were reading books and they were talking about the books they were reading and they were laughing together and I just wanted to join that club. So when a little kid sees adults reading, that's not so motivating. Adults are in a whole different world. They're a different kind of animal from me. But if I see, if I'm five years old and I see seven-year-olds or eight-year-olds reading and talking about books, I think, wow, I could probably do that. I could probably join that gl club, and I want to do it. So the power of age mixing to pull you up, scaffold you up to higher ways of, of thinking, higher ways of doing things is, is extraordinary. Throughout human history, children always played in age mix groups. It's only with the advent of modern schools that we've segregated children by age. And now, of course, we segregate them by age even out of school worst thing we could do in terms of their ability to educate themselves. But it's not just the little kids learning from the bigger kids. The bigger kids are, in many ways, learning extremely important lessons by interacting with the little kids. They're learning how to be leaders. They're learning how to be nurturing. They are learning through teaching. Whenever you're explaining something to somebody, you have to reframe it in your own mind. You have to sort of understand it better than you, other, than you previously did in order to explain. Anybody who's ever taught knows that you learn more by teaching than by being taught. And so whenever children are interacting in that way, explaining whether it's rules of the game, rules of the school, whatever it is, they are consolidating that in their own mind in a more sophisticated way by virtue of having to explain it to somebody else. And also the little kids are providing a sort of ever a source of energy and creativity that infects the older kids. Over and over again, we'll see cases where somebody, some teenager comes to the school, first new student at the school, who's been kind of burned out and cynical and depressed. But it's hard to be burned out and cynical and depressed if there's a bunch of four and five-year-olds running around who want you to give them a piggyback ride, you know? <laughs> and so this kind of, and, and also this, there's this creative energy, and, the, and also just even the fact that you've got all this stuff for little kids, clay and paints and, blocks and so on, older kids find themselves playing with these things. And so they retain sort of these creative activities beyond what you would normally find with teenagers in a, in a setting where it's just teenagers. They would feel like they've outgrown that stuff. But because it's there, because there's little kids doing it, they get drawn to continuing to do these creative things. Six characteristic, immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. This is a characteristic I've added on fairly recently. I used to just talk about five characteristics. But the more I think about it, the more I'm convinced that this is an important part of it. We don't grow up just, we don't grow up just for ourselves. We don't, grow up, we don't grow up with the idea of educating ourselves just for ourselves. We also grow up with the idea of educating ourselves so we can be decent members of a community, so we can be helpful to other people. And children at Sudbury Valley, there are, they are part, for the time that they're there, they are a real integral part of the community. They have a vote. They know that their decisions are, are actually have real consequences. And one of the things I learned from a lot of the graduates is that they went on, one of the things when I asked them what they felt were the advantages of such an education, a lot of them talked about the democratic values that they left the school with. They feel that they see their responsibility towards the community, towards the world, they exert that responsibility more than they believe they would if they had gone to a more typical school where they would not have felt so much a real part of the community that they're growing up in. In a hunter-gatherer band, it's a similar kind of story that you don't have the voting process, but nevertheless, you have a situation where children are respected, where they're taken seriously, where they know that they're going to grow up to be adults in this community, they see how the community works and they're growing up and there's a set of moral principles associated with the community and they're growing up immersed in those kind, those sort of moral, moral principles. Well, I'm going to stop there. I've already talked way longer than I had meant to. So thank you very much for your, your